good afternoon and welcome. It is my uh, great pleasure to present uh, today's uh, guest speaker, uh, Roberta Kaplan. Um, Roberta um, uh, is a graduate of um, Harvard College and Columbia Law School, um, clerked for a federal judge in Boston, Mark Wolf, and then uh, New York Judge uh, Judith Kay, and she then joined the uh, large uh, New York-based law firm, uh, Paul Weiss. Um, and she made partner within three years there, which is quite unusual. Um, although um, Roberta first came to great public attention when she won a famous case, United States versus Windsor, in front of the Supreme Court in 2013, she was already known as a very accomplished litigator well before that, as I believe uh, most members of the audience know. Uh, the Windsor case was a landmark case um, in regard to same-sex marriage, and Roberta will be talking about that a bit in a few moments. Um, she, uh, in a, that case has had broad ramifications um, for uh, same-sex marriage, um, both at a federal and at a state level. Um, she has litigated other cases in that realm since then. She is also currently involved in um, uh, several high profile cases, um, one involving um, white supremacy in uh, Virginia and um, another case involving um, a rape allegation involving the President of the United States. Um, and so I'm very appreciative that uh, Roberta has uh, taken time out of a very busy schedule to spend some time with us. And so I'd like to start out uh, today's conversation by asking Roberta if she could uh, tell us of how she got involved in representing um, Edie Windsor, who was the plaintiff in the landmark case uh, um, involving uh, marital, marital benefits for same-sex couples. So I, I think the one word answer to that question, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be here, although no one is in person, unfortunately. Uh, I think the answer, the one word answer to your question is happenstance. Um, what happened in the, can people hear me okay? I can, yes. What, what happened in the Windsor case is that um, it turns out that Edie had been trying, had been calling around and trying to get a lawyer uh, and had reached out to a number of the civil rights organizations that you would suspect, would expect her to call uh, and had been turned down. And she got, she was friends with a guy who was friends with a guy uh, who was also a friend of ours. He, he was at the time a headhunter uh, for law firms. He, he placed lateral partners at law firms. Um, and he called me up and he said, I, I know this woman, Edie Windsor, um, she may have this case about challenging DOMA. She had to pay this huge estate tax or will have to pay this huge estate tax now that her spouse has died. Um, would you be interested in taking the case? Um, it turns out, I, I didn't know Edie at the time, but as I described in my book, I knew exactly who she was. Uh, another great coincidence that has to do, kind of amazing that happened in the case. Um, and I went to her house the next day and met her and heard what she had to say and heard how compelling her story was and how kind of articulate, not to mention beautiful she was. And it took me, I think I think said about 40 seconds to decide that, that it was absolutely the right case to take. And just for those, for those um, in the uh, audience who might not know the details, I will just uh, review one detail. Um, um, Edie and her longtime uh, partner, uh, Thea Spire, were married in Canada in uh, 2007. And after um, Thea died, the United States uh, government um, uh, landed a $363,000 estate tax bill on, um, on Edie, which would not have happened if she had been in what uh, I guess the United States would have considered at that time a normal marriage. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask, um, have Roberta talk about a bit is the way that she designed the case. Um, law cases, as I'm sure most of you know, can often involve abstract uh, principles, but 
cases involve real people. So I want to just read uh, to uh, back to uh, Roberta something that she wrote and so that the audience can get a better sense of the way that she designed the case. And these are the first three paragraphs in what are known as a preliminary statement when the case came up for summary judgment um, in, the, uh, in the trial court. And it reads as follows. Edith Schlain Windsor, or Edie, is the sole executor of the state of her late spouse, Thea Clara Spire. Prior to Thea's death in February 2009, Edie and Thea spent over four decades together in a loving, committed union. At the beginning of their relationship in 1965, neither Thea nor Edie imagined that they would have had the opportunity to legally marry. But Edie and Thea had the courage and self-respect to get engaged, and after engagement that lasted more than 40 years, Edie and Thea were finally wed in May 2007. Sadly, Edie and Thea were able to spend less than two years as a married couple before Thea passed away at the age of 77. Then, while grieving the loss of the love of her life, Edie also had to face the injustice of the federal government's refusal to recognize her marriage. Under Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, otherwise known as DOMA, which requires the federal government to disregard marriages that are valid under state law if they are not between one man and one woman, the federal government treated Edie and Thea as if they were legal strangers. Because of DOMA, the federal government imposed more than 363,000 in federal estate tax on Thea's estate, significantly reducing Edie's inheritance. Yet if Thea, T-H-E-A, were instead Theo, T-H-E-O, her estate would have passed to Edie tax-free. For Edie and Thea, the tax for being gay exceeded $363,000. Floor is yours again, Roberta. Oh, I have been, I should give a little bit of background. So I've been litigating, or uh, been involved in litigating gay rights cases at that point for several years. And I had actually uh, litigated uh, in New York under the New York Constitution, uh, the, a freedom to marry case that went all the way up to the uh, Court of Appeals, which is New York's highest court, and lost in 2006. Um, and I, I, you know, if you look at the expanse of the cases, kind of the history of LGBT litigation with respect to marriage, if you go all the way back to the arguments in 2003 and all the way up to the arguments in 2013, uh, with uh, 2013 in Windsor and then 2015 in Obergefell. The arguments don't really change. The same arguments under the Equal Protection Clause and, and, and under the Due, due Process Clause and, and some of the marriage cases were pretty much the same with the way we wrote them in 2003, 2004, as the way they were written at the Supreme Court in 2013 and 2015. So the question then is what happened? What's the difference? The law, you know, the, the Constitution obviously stayed the same. And the fundamental principles under both those clauses stayed the same. And, and we were convinced uh, that in order to persuade a court, and ultimately we knew, we didn't know our case would go to the Supreme Court, but we knew that a case would go to the Supreme Court, that we had to persuade the judges deciding the case that the marriage that Edie had to Thea uh, was no different than the marriages they had to their son. And in fact, in a lot of ways, was very admirable because uh, one of the things that Professor Weinstein didn't mention is that Thea, um, if for about the last 20 years of her life, was a quadriplegic. She had very expensive, very serious multiple sclerosis, and she was completely paralyzed. And Edie nursed her, uh, literally, um, for many, many years. And so you have to think to yourself, if I, God forbid, if that were to happen to me, and I were to get MS, the kind of spouse I would want is Edie Windsor. And we want you to figure out how to best convey that uh, uh, to the court. So that's the way and why we wrote the summary judgment brief the way we did. If you look at our SCOTUS brief, it reads the same way. The, the first couple of pages is really about their love story. So you, you were humanizing the case from the start. Yeah. We were convinced, again, it, the, the legal issues, believe it or not, are not that complex. Well, we, the, the hurdle that we had to overcome is that the judges deciding the case had to see their marriage as at least analogous to, if not the same as their marriages. And we were convinced the minute they saw that, we would win. And so from day one, you know, we were very, very, very honed in on 
telling the story, telling the story of Edie and Thea, telling, talking about their marriage, and convincing both the judges and frankly the American public that this was a marriage unlike, I mean, like anyone else's in certain respects, you know, really admirable marriage. Right. So could you talk a little bit about about how you went about preparing for the case? How did you, I mean, people that you worked with, how did you, how did, it's a, this is a big undertaking taking a case like this to the Supreme Court. So once we, you know, the first couple of, uh, the first year or so of the case, we were pretty much handling, you know, ourselves and that was fine. But as soon as it got to the point where we realized that our case actually might get to the Supreme Court, I knew I needed help. Um, the Supreme Court has a very specialized bar, um, and the justices care about that bar, and we needed someone who was a specialist in, in that area. So I called, uh, uh, it's amazing every time I tell the story, but I called a person who's now a very good friend of mine, Pam Carlin, a professor at Stanford, out of the blue. I think it was on July 4th, which I think was a weekend that year, it was 2013. No, oh, it was 2012, I guess, the summer before. And I said, we have this case um, that may be going to the Supreme Court. You know, would you help us out on it? Would you like to work on it with us? Pam, at that point in time, you know, not was supposed to take a sabbatical semester in the spring in Italy. Um, but instead of doing that sabbatical, she deferred it um, and stayed in California and worked on the case with us. And, has since become one of my dearest friends, and we never would have won the case without it. And I take it that you did a lot of practice arguments um, before the, uh, known as moots, before the argument? In, in yeah, Washington. so once, once the, let me go back a little bit. So, so when you get, your court gets accepted, your case gets accepted at the Supreme Court, there's this kind of crazy period that you go into. Uh, the first part of it is writing the brief, and at that point, um, I had a, a home office, not the office I'm in now, I had a home office in the city that's very small. And because I didn't want any distractions, I wrote the entire brief with everyone else in that office. And I, because we had so many people with lots of different opinions, I kept the authority <laughs> to make any changes to the brief. And I honestly don't think I took off my, the same pair of sweatpants probably for three weeks, but I was just sitting in this room with huge piles of drafts coming in and out, kind of deciding what to go in and what to go out. We also had, I think, 45 amicus briefs on our side uh, that we had to coordinate. Um, and so that was a huge, huge undertaking. And once that brief was submitted, then you go through the process of preparing for argument. And we went through a series of what are called moot courts. I think we did about six or seven formal moot courts um, and dozens more informally. Um, and what that means is you literally sit in a room or stand in a room, you make the arguments, usually in front of a panel of nine, seven or nine uh, people who actually are supposed to act as if they're the Supreme Court justices. Sometimes they take on the personalities of particular justices. You kind of present the argument, you decide what works and what doesn't work. And then the really fun part after that is you spend about another hour, that's usually about 45 minutes to an hour. And then you spend another hour listening to them dissect every single word that you've said. Um, I don't know, maybe um, it would be more, di more difficult or more painful to go through surgery without anesthesia, but I'm not sure it would be. Uh, <laughs> it was a very painful process, but it was incredibly helpful. Um, and over that period of those three months, we really honed the arguments. And you want to be at the point, the Supreme Court argument is very, very different than a, either a district court argument or even an appellate court argument particularly in a case like this, because it's so politicized, it's such a hot button case, um, it's so kind of there in the press, on the, you know, on TV every night, that when the justices come in, it's not like you're going to change anyone's mind. They've already probably, they certainly read everything, and they probably formed an opinion. And really, your job there is not to persuade the justices so much, it's to help the justices on your side argue kind of which is what they do during the argument against the judges on the other side um it's a very different it's a very different process i really had to learn it because i'm used to going to court and trying to persuade either the district court judge or the panel of three judges the appellate court and scotus argument at least in the hot button case is very different great one thing i forgot to mention at the start is that uh, Roberta wrote a great book, and you can get more detail about her preparation, the argument in this book called Then Comes Marriage. 
which is a, is a great book for, for the general public, but certainly I recommend this book to, to any law student. So, okay, so you, at the time that you were getting ready to argue this case, the court is, you know, uh, divided. It's, it's been fractured for some time. And um, at the time, um, I know even our Anthony Kennedy was considered sort of the pivot point in the court. And in fact, our former Dean, Erwin Chemerinsky, uh, said a few times, he said, if I could even put his photo on the cover of my brief, that I would do it. So in terms of thinking about how, about how you wanted to argue the case, I mean, how much did your thoughts about Justice Kennedy and his jurists, you know, his thoughts about issues like this enter into your preparation? So like, like Erwin Chemerinsky, we thought about Justice Kennedy 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we knew that Justice Kennedy would, would likely be the deciding vote. And in this area, even more to the point, uh, Justice Kennedy really did establish kind of a unique uh, his, history kind of uh, for himself in terms of the LGBT cases. He has, um, until the time he retired, um, he had decided and written the opinion in all four of the major Supreme Court LGBT rights cases. So started with Lawrence, then Romer, um, then Windsor, then Obergefell, he wrote all four. At that point, he'd only written Lawrence and Romer. Um, and we knew that he was the guy we had to convince. Um, so our brief uh, was written very much to appeal to him. The argument that we thought would win the case was uh, kind of a uh, doctrine that he had established under the Equal Protection Clause called either Rational Basis Plus or you know, some, somewhere between Rational Basis Review and Heightened Scrutiny Review. Um, and he had suggested that that kind of review is appropriate when there's what's called, what's known as animus um, on the part of the legislature when, when enacting the statute. So those are the things that we, even though we made all the other arguments, those were the arguments we thought would win. So we focused on them uh, most intensively. Um, and then in the weeks kind of leading up to the Supreme Court argument, we actually created a, uh, a two page sheet sheet, which we called Kennedy's Greatest Hits. Um, and we took the major passages, the most important passages from Lawrence and Romer, and we wrote them down. And I actually went around the city of Washington, D.C., kind of saying them out loud to myself. I'm sure I look like the crazy person, anyone who saw me. But I wanted them to be on the tip of my lips so that I could use them in the argument. And I, I did, in fact, do, I did, in fact, use um, some very crucial language from the Lawrence case about time blinding. Uh, generations. Um, I don't think I scored any points for subtlety, however. I, I, I was pretty sure that all the justices knew exactly what I was doing. Well, one of the, besides the question that you were talking about before about the standards, and you know, when you're thinking about Justice Kennedy's greatest hits, lip, the words liberty and dignity right. seem to be very important. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so in our case in particular, the dignity was the key word, really, because liberty is more about right to marry, and our argument was that Edie was already married, so we didn't even make a due process argument, but dignity was incredibly important, and in fact, when I first spoke to Edie, uh, and she talked about having to pay this tax, believe it or not, the word that she used was indignity. She said, I'm indignant at the idea that I have to pay this tax as if Theo was a stranger to me. Um, so our brief, I, I don't know how many times we used the word dignity, we used it a lot. In his opinion in Windsor, I think he used it something like 21 times. Um, and this concept of equal dignity, that people are entitled to equal dignity under the law, um, was, which was already kind of developing since Romer, became, I think, really the keystone of his jurisprudence as a result of Windsor. In, in, in the decision, in the opinion that Justice Kennedy wrote, he also, besides talking about, you know, your client and her and her spouse and other people in these marriages, he also talked a lot about, or to some degree, about the impact on ch on their children. Could you? Yeah. Yeah. So that was an interesting issue. So even if they had never had children, um, Edie has said, I think we talked about this that they had talked about it, but they had been concerned that, that society at that time was too, frankly, insensitive and prejudiced and, and there was a lack of understanding and they didn't want that to have a negative impact on their kids. She's told me often that had she been born 
in my generation, for example, she surely would have had children. And just by happenstance, she was very, very close to my son, um, who just the other night talked about how much he misses her. Um, but we knew that the issue of children, excuse me, was going to be very, very important to Justice Kennedy. Because whatever you think, and we know Justice Kennedy is a religious Catholic, whatever you think about the morality of LGBTQ relationships, and let's just put that to one side, whether you know people have obviously very different views on that. But I think for anyone who's going to be honest about their religion, um, for the children to suffer as a result of their parents' relationship clearly is not right. It's clearly kind of a terrible result. And so we knew that focusing on the kids and the impact that it would have on the kids was going to have a big influence. And so the amicus briefs uh, that we got in the case, again, because there, wasn't, there weren't children in Egan Thea's marriage, the amicus briefs that we got uh, were very focused on that issue. And I think were very persuasive on the issue. I and mean, it was an issue that I had been arguing in my career all the way back to the time I was a clerk for Judge uh, Judith Kay on the New York Court of Appeals, where we decided the adoption case in New York and allowed gay people to adopt for exactly the same kind of reason. Right. And the, you, you mentioned the importance of, of amicus brief around, around children. I think it would also be useful if you could just say a little bit about it. You, you got amicus briefs from a very wide range, and one of them related to people in the military which has yeah. a very, could you talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, so we were, I was really interested in getting kind of all the traditional amicus briefs that you kind of always get in all these in LGBTQ rights cases, but I also wanted what I would call different amicus briefs uh, that were not so standard in these cases. So one of them, for example, was we had a lot of uh, religious briefs in the past that came from LGBTQ religious groups. But in our case, I wanted religious briefs from non-LGBTQ religious groups. So we got, for example, uh, the entire conservative Jewish movement uh, for the first time in its history signed on to the amicus brief uh, in our case. Uh, same thing for the Methodists, as I recall, and, and a bunch of other groups. Um, and we had the same approach toward the military. At this point in time, you guys, some of you may be too young to remember this, but don't ask, don't tell was already the policy in the United States military. And as a result, there were quite a number of openly gay uh, soldiers and sailors who were also married. Um, and it was already the case um, that they were suffering, to use Edie and, and Justice Kennedy's word, indignity, uh, as a result of the fact that though they were married, the, the military couldn't really recognize their marriages. So we did uh, two really powerful briefs about those issues. It was something that we focused on, not only in the briefs, but I had it in my opening, where I was gonna talk about this horrible situation where there were soldiers who had died who were married. Um, and as you can imagine, in the military, when you die in service, on duty, uh, respect for the soldier and for his family is a very high value, understandably so. Uh, but because of DOMA, because the spouse of these soldiers were not spouses for purposes of federal law, the government was prevented from notifying them even of their spouse's death. They would have to notify the parent or a sibling instead. And I had been told by someone very, very close to me who was uh, now a partner again at Paul White, uh, Dave Johnson, then the Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, um, that the military brass, like the top brass in the Pentagon was literally agonizing over this. They just thought it was so offensive and unfair. And I was going to feature that, uh, uh, ironically enough, in my argument, but then Don Verrilli used instead. <laughs> so I had to find another example. Okay, thank you. So let's just talk a little bit more about the, about the argument. Did anything happen in the argument that surprised you, and, or, and, and sort of a companion question. I assume there were four judges, four justices, I'd say, were pretty strongly against you, or one of them quite aggressively so. Did, did, what happened in the room? I mean, what was that like? I mean, and were, I assume that they were sort of trying to throw you, throw you off your argument. The hardest thing for me was the waiting. Um, there was a whole standing issue that actually Pam was supposed to argue, but then they didn't give her any argument time, but there was a whole issue about whether uh, the bipartisan legal advisory group, which was basically the House Republicans, had standing to argue the case the way they did against us because the government had changed positions 
and was agreeing with us that DOMA was unconstitutional. And that argument went before ours and it was lengthy. And then uh, before I got up, um, Don Verrilli argued. So I was almost the last lawyer, not the second last lawyer. I guess I was the last lawyer to argue. So there was a lot of waiting. I was, I remember just kind of being on the edge of my seat that, yeah, with ants in my pants. Like I just wanted to get it, get it on the, mo um, get the show on the road. Um, by the time I got up there, first of all, everything happens like in a nanosecond. Like everything in terms of both how you're thinking and how quickly the argument goes, at least in your perception of it, you know, it flies by. A couple of things that I remember were that the, the liberal justices, uh, with the exception, I think, of one softball from Judge Sotomayor and one question from Justice Breyer that he asked both me and my adversary, Paul Clement, uh, none of the other liberal justices asked me a question. Um, and that's a very good sign um, because, as Pam had told me, you know, whatever they say to you, she said, particularly with Justice Kagan, just follow whatever she does. Just agree with her no matter what she asks you. Um, but, but that wasn't an issue because they, they weren't really asking any questions. I knew that was a sign they thought I was doing okay. Um, most of the, ironically, most of the harsh questioning, and I don't think people would have expected this, did not come from Justice Scalia. He asked me one question or two. Um, most of the kind of directed questioning at me came from the Chief Justice, um, who I could tell was not happy about the way the case was going. Um, and you're very close. He's right in the middle and you're very close to him when you're arguing. Um, and I remember I could tell he was kind of mad about it. And I remember thinking to myself kind of again in this like split second thinking like, okay, I understand you're, you're not happy with me right now, but I'm a lawyer in New York and I've been in front of judges who are far worse than this. <laughs> this is nothing compared to some of the New York judges. And so I just, you know, I answered the questions the way I normally would. Um, almost every answer I gave was something that we practiced dozens and dozens of times in these new courts. I literally want it to be kind of muscle memory. Uh, but there was one question that I answered and I just, I didn't get a chance to practice it. Like I, you know, it was just something that kind of came into my head. And it was about the, um, in, the in 1996 when Doe was passed, um, the House report said that they were doing, they were passing DOMA based on a moral, um, disapproval of gay people in their relationships. And one of the big issues that came up in the argument was what had changed, you know, how to explain this incredible difference between the world in 1996, where the Congress could pass a law saying they morally disapproved of gay people, and the situation we were in in 2013. And it just popped into my head that the difference was now, rather than being a moral disapproval, there was a moral understanding that gay people are no different than anyone else and their relationships are no different. And I remember thinking to myself, again, everything's happening so fast in your brain. Okay, you know, I think this is a good argument. It sounds like a good thing to say. I can't turn around and ask Pam if she agrees with me, <laughs> but I'm just going to go for it. Um, and I, I think it was the best line I made. I said, basically, what the difference was is we had gone from a moral disapproval to a moral understanding that gay people were no different. Right. So, you, you won the case five to four, and Justice Kennedy wrote, um, wrote the opinion and, and said he definitely talked about dignity, he talked about children. There was a, uh, there were, I guess, a couple of dissents, particularly a scathing dissent by, from Justice Scalia, who basically said the earth was going to fall in after this. Um, for a justice who wrote a lot of scathing dissents, this would have to be in the top three for him, for sure. Uh -huh. He also did this black line where he showed that the implications of Windsor were going to mean that there was going to be nationwide marriage equality, which of course he was right about. Right. Uh, I'm not sure the black line really helped his cause, but there's a lot of judges followed that in the years between 2013 and 2015. Well, right. That was one of the things I was going to ask you about because um, Professor Tribe, um, you know, from Harvard Law School said that, that he'd never seen a case before that had so rapid an impact on lower courts. Now, I know that you continue to litigate in this area. Could you, you could just talk about one case you did after this, which is in the state of Mississippi? Yeah, so shortly after this, we got a call from some, there's a group in, um, in the South called Campaign for Southern Equality. And, and as you can imagine, gay people uh, in Mississippi did not really have the same privileges, to say the least, as gay people have in the state of California or in the state of New York. And so they wanted us to bring a challenge 
uh, the law in Mississippi that prohibited marriage between gay people, and we brought it, and we got assigned to, I think, one of the best judges in the country today, and a great man, Carlton Reeves. Um, and we put on a trial. We had a trial, and he decided um, that uh, gay people do have the right to marry under Windsor. Um, and then we got to the Fifth Circuit, and I actually think the Fifth Circuit probably would have gone our way. Uh, but by that time, it was kind of mooted out because the court decided Obergefell. And so there was no need for them to decide. So just before we move on to another topic, I want to ask that the composition of the court has changed significantly recently. Um, Justice Kennedy retired, um, replaced by, uh, you know, Kavanaugh. Um, and, you know, what was, a, what was a five to four court is now widely viewed as a six to three court. And the people that have come on the court are, have not been people who seem particularly sympathetic to this. Do you have any concerns that the Windsor case or the Obergefell case could be in danger because of the change in the court? I don't think they're directly in danger. And I'll explain. So the reason I don't think they're directly in danger is really two reasons. One, it's very hard to unmarry people. I mean, unless they divorce. <laughs> it's, it's hard to unmarry people. And we have established a system in this country now of LGBT marriage and children, as you've been saying, of, of LGBT marriages, that I think even for a justice who thinks that Windsor and Obergefell were wrongly decided, is very, very hard to overturn. So in Amy Coney Barrett's terminology, I would bet in my gut that she thinks that Windsor and Obergefell are what she calls super precedents, in the sense that even if they were wrongly decided, having have people having relied on them so significantly for so long, they shouldn't be overturned. That's my guess. Uh, the second reason, I think, uh, which is just a very practical reason, is that they all know all the justices at this point know gay people who are married. Um, and for them to have to turn to their friends or their relatives or some, or even some of them, their clerks, and say that your marriage is now invalid, I, I think is an almost impossible thing for them to do just as a human being. So I'm not worried about a direct, a successful direct attack on Lindsay and Obergefell. Uh, what I am worried about is a su successful indirect attack. Um, and what I mean by that is I think you know, there's a, a very strong sentiment among those six justices, or many of those six justices, um, about religious freedom. And, and uh, they just argued a case in the city of Philadelphia the other day. And the sense that laws that are generally applicable, um, uh, perhaps, and certainly are applicable, obviously, to African Americans. Like, you can't have a law that distinguishes African Americans in any way. Um, even if you have a religious view about African Americans, as horrible as that would be, that's different. And that was true, by the way, uh, in the 1950s. The Southern Baptists, there were varieties of Southern Baptists that were, had very strong racial views, racist views at the time. But that today everyone accepts the fact that you, can, you don't have a religious exception to discriminate against Black people. Um, I think the justices on the court are, are, I'm hoping not a majority, but I think a substantial number think there should be a religious exception to allow you to discriminate against LGBT people. So while I, I don't think anyone will say that the government can discriminate by not giving marriages, I think they will kind of chip away at it and maybe even kind of knock through a big hole in the sense of allowing individual government officials, individual government programs, certainly private citizens, cake bakers, uh, photographers, you name it, uh, to exercise their so-called religious liberties to not recognize gay people's marriages. Yeah, interestingly, uh, as you know, on the first day of the court this year, both uh, Justice Alito and Justice Thomas made some very strong comments in that regard, very, uh, very, you know, in, a, in the case involving a woman in Kentucky who didn't want to give a marriage certificate, right. sort of struck me as very ironic, Justice Thomas, one of the great critics of the Warren Court, could not have been married to his wife, um, but for the Leving versus Virginia decision, which, uh, you know, struck down laws prohibiting people from being married who were not of the same race. So it's pretty tough. So we'll see what, we'll see what they do. It's going to be very interesting what they do in the Philadelphia adoption case. That My firm actually was on the papers 
uh, that was just argued because, um, you know, I th think they're trying to make the argument that it's not really a problem because there are other adoption agencies in Philadelphia um, that can, that will perform these adoptions. But at a certain point, it gets to a certain level where there really aren't other options. And when you get to say, like Mississippi, for example, you know, there are not a lot of options if you're going to have a law that allows people against, religiously against gay marriages to, to refuse to recognize them. So we really could be in kind of a two-tier country, sadly, where states like California and New York, there's freedom uh, to marry, complete freedom, and in states like Mississippi and Alabama, there won't be. Right. Uh, for those of you in the audience who aren't familiar with this, I should have mentioned earlier the case that Re Roberta is just referring to is called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, which was recently argued in the court. Um, before we move on to one other major topic, I want to ask you about a personal career thing. So here you are, you've won this gigantic case, and you're at a highly prestigious law firm where you became partner at a very early age, and then you decided to leave the firm and strike out on your own with a new firm. Could you talk a little bit about what led to that? Sure. Um, it, it's not, uh, I learned so much at Paul Weiss, so it's, it's not a criticism of Paul Weiss in any way. Uh, but as kind of big law had developed over the years, both the sizes of the cases and the variety of cases that big firms were are able to do had become increasingly narrow. And what I mean by that is, this, when I say size of the cases, they really could, clients could really only afford to hire a Paul Weiss for a huge, huge, huge matter. And similarly, the types of the cases, Paul Weiss was getting priced out of the market in, in, in anything but like these huge, either regulatory or huge kind of, you know, Goliath versus Goliath fights. When I had started practicing law, when I learned to, to litigate at Paul Weiss, it was very different. You know, there were a lot Greater, I think Paul Weiss at that time did every kind of case, um, including divorce cases, which they didn't do, you know, from what they certainly don't do now, and to be honest, I don't think I would do now, but they, they pretty much litigated anything, and they litigated from small to big cases, and I kind of missed that mix, and so one of the main goals of my firm was to kind of recreate this idea uh, that what a client is looking for in a firm is a great litigator. Um, someone who can marshal the facts, put together the argument, write, you know, a preliminary statement and a summary judgment brief the way the, the statement that you read uh, reads, and do that regardless of whether it's a contract case, a statutory case, uh, if, uh, antitrust case, it doesn't really matter. It, it's the skills of the litigator that matter. Um, I, and that's what we did. And, and on top of that, I wanted to be as committed uh, to public interest um, and pro bono work uh, as, as I'd always been. And I saw on the horizon, we started our firm in July 2017. So I was prescient enough, it didn't take much, uh, to know at the time that the country was going to be besieged um, under the Trump administration by just a huge slew of fights that need to happen in all kinds of fronts. And I wanted our firm uh, to be available to do them. Okay. So Speaking of all kinds of things that are going on, one of the major things that you've taken on in recent years is a case involved, evolving out of the tragic events in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, where there was a, a, a first march by a white supremacist with tiki torches, and then the next day, um, a man driving through the crowd and killing a young woman who was involved, Heather Heyer was involved in a counter protest. So uh, it's a could you talk a bit about the case that your firm is now um, involved in stemming out of the Charlottesville event and to talk a bit about who your client is and what the potent, what the goals of the case are? Sure. So let me just kind of tell the story. So our firm, again, as I said, we opened in July 1, I think it was, 2017. We worked for the whole first month. We didn't have offices. And we moved into our offices, I think it was August 7th, 2013. Um, the events of Charlottesville, for those who don't know, happened on August 11th and 12th, um, 2017. And I remember that Monday, I think we only had about three, maybe like six total employees at the firm. But I remember for lunch, I decided that we should watch some of the coverage of what had happened. Um, and as I was watching, and I think we ordered in pizza or something, as we were watching the coverage, not only was it obviously shocking, 
Um, but I realized that something needed to be done. And I was very concerned at that point that then Attorney General Jeff Sessions uh, was not going to devote the resources of the Civil Rights Division, which had, after all, been formed to bring cases like this, um, to Charlottesville. And so I thought to myself, well, if the DOJ is not going to do it, someone has to, and it might as well be me. Um, Within a short period of time, I called uh, people, someone people probably know, Dahlia Lithwick, who writes for um, Slate Magazine, who's a good friend. I called her not for her, for her legal advice, although I got her legal advice, I called her more because I knew that for the past two decades, she lived in Charlottesville. And so I kind of said to her, look, I had this crazy idea, thinking about bringing a case about Charlottesville, what do you think? And she said to me, first of all, it's a great idea. Um, you should come down. I will put you in touch with some people who can help you out. Um, but honestly, Robbie, we are in the process of actually packing a van because we're going to be moving to New York because we decided we, the situation here is just so horrible and the anti-Semitism is so vicious that we can't live here with our kids anymore. We're going to have to move to New York. Um, within about 48 hours or 72 hours of that call, we were on a plane to Charlottesville. Um, I think it's fair to say that the town was really still in a state of shock at that point. Uh, people, particularly in the African American community, were really still terrified. And these white vans that a lot of the neo Nazis and uh, white nationalists had used to come into town, they were these white Mercedes vans, were still kind of driving around the city, especially in the African American neighborhoods. Uh, we met with a whole bunch of people. Um, several of those people ultimately became our clients. Uh, we told them that if they, and some of them had been severely injured, um, that if they needed money, which was understandable, and they needed money quickly, that our case was not the case for them, that they might have a claim against the police department for some kind of contributory negligence. If they were involved in the events on Friday night, they might have a claim against University of Virginia uh, for what happened on campus there. I said, um, but in our case, it was going to take a very long time. We were going to go after the organizers of who did it. Um, and it was very likely at the end of the game that we wouldn't get enough money from these guys to satisfy the judge. Notwithstanding all that, um, many of our plaintiffs who I met at that point and then subsequently signed on, incredibly brave people, um, they uh, range from undergrads, including an African American guy who was kind of encircled by the white supremacists while they were standing around the Thomas Jefferson statute, um, having uh, lit tiki torches and fuel being thrown at them. And he, he is said he literally thought he was going to die. Uh, to people, to ministers um, who were at the church across the street on Friday night where they were basically barricaded inside because of what was going on across the street. Uh, to people who came out to protest on Saturday, I think four or five of whom were actually struck by the car themselves. Uh, one of whom who's um, in that famous photo of the large black man kind of being thrown above the car. Um, he's a defendant in our case, Marcus, and his then fiance, Marissa, is a defendant, a plaintiff in our case, excuse me. And he actually saved her life that day by pushing her out of the way uh, as the car was coming toward them. Um, so those are the, those are the plaintiffs. The defendants are kind of the, <laughs> the greatest hits, should I, should I put it that way, of the alt-right. Um, what we did is we got a, a very lucky great break. There was a group called, there's a group called Unicorn Riot, and they somehow got a hold of the Discord servers that the organizers for Charlottesville had been using for many weeks and even months up until up till the events, <laughs> excuse me, to organize what they were gonna do. And they publicized those Discord chats publicly. So we were able to use them to figure out who was involved, who were the leaders, and who we should sue. And so the defendants range from Richard Spencer, who's probably the most famous person in the alt-right, uh, who was one of the organizers of the events, uh, to Chris Cantwell, People Saw the Vice video. He's the crying Nazi in that video. Uh, to groups like Vanguard America, which are actually still pretty active on campus, campuses throughout the country. Uh, it, it's quite a group of people. I think we have 13 defendants in the case. Um, and, and then once we had all that, we had to come up with a legal theory, of course. Um, and in order to find a viable theory, sadly, or ironically, maybe, we had to go back to a statute passed in 1871, the Q Cook Plan Act of 1871, 
which has a perfect, and, and as everyone probably knows, most of the civil rights statutes that we use and rely on today apply to the government. They don't apply to private conduct. But the, uh, oh, the KKK Act of 1871 does, and it says that if you organize, if you engage in a conspiracy to commit what it says is racialized violence, violence based on racial motives, then you can be liable under the statute. It has not been used very often. Uh, it's been used successfully even less. Um, it was used successfully right after it was passed, when the KKK was forming in the South. It was used in the 1920s when there were terrible racial riots successfully. And it was used by a couple of families of freedom riders who've been killed uh, in the civil rights movement. Uh, but it's the statute we've used here. and We've won a motion to dismiss, saying it applies. A uh, trial is scheduled to take place this spring, subject to COVID. Uh, if it's not safe to go to trial then, because we obviously want a jury, they'll probably get pushed off into the fall. And what are the what are the remedies that you're seeking in the case? What are the so the, the greatest remedy, you know, following oh, Following precedents. Take your time. One down the long too, sorry. Following precedents have been set by groups like the SPLC. We seek his money. And we seek monetary damages. All these individual groups, individuals and groups. And one of the reasons we're seeking monetary damages is we want, first of all, obviously, we want to get the damages for our plaintiffs who suffered so greatly. But second of all, we want it to act as a deterrent. We want it to send a signal to people that if you're thinking about engaging in organized racial violence in the United States of America, if you're not criminally prosecuted, which we hope you are, you are going to suffer very, very severe, serious civil remedies. And many of the, at least two of the defendants have filed for bankruptcy already. We've gotten discovery sanctions already in the, I think they total now in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, they have said online, because we still follow them, as you can imagine, online, that they have been greatly inhibited in their activities as a result of the case. Um, and that's exactly what we wanted to achieve here. So we're seeking uh, monetary damages, we're seeking injunctive relief, um, and most likely we will have to continue chasing them for damages for many years. So that if any of these guys, you know, ultimately try to come into money and buy a house, we're going to want to lean on their house. If they get a job, we're going to want to garnish their wages, at least until our, our clients get paid what they should for the, again, the horrible damages they suffer. So, so without hopefully engaging in hyperbole, it would seem to me that doing a case like that would involve some personal danger for you. Um, anything from, you know, hate mail, physical violence. Would you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, so, I mean, in a way, the contrast is quite amazing. And I, I guess it says something about where our country has, has where our country has come to today. Um, in the Windsor case, there were one or two things that came up. I remember just before argument, I got some kind of a letter that some prayer groups were going to pray for me to lose the case. But I mean, it was pretty mild stuff. Flash forward to 2017 in Charlottesville. Um, and the stuff that is said about me and the other lawyers in the case on the internet, um, and, now, and more particularly on the dark web, which we, we have a group monitoring for us every day, uh, is pretty shocking to say the least. So um, every day we get an email from our security people kind of with, with a list of what they've said about us that day. I've learned not to read it before I go to bed. Um, Chris Cantwell, um, who's actually was convicted uh, in the District of New Hampshire for threatening another person, believe it or not, who was also in the alt-right. A week before he made that threat, threatened me and said that he was gonna have, excuse my language, a lot of fucking fun with me uh, when the case was over. Um, so it's, it's pretty outrageous. I mean, again, I think it's a symptom of a wider problem in our society today where people seem to think it's okay to do and say things that were, everyone would have been ashamed of doing and saying five, 10 years ago, uh, but it's certainly come out very much in our case, and we, we do have to be careful about our security. Right. We argued well, the motion to dismiss, 
Um, my my co-counsel Karen Dunn insisted that we wear bulletproof vests um, from the car into the courthouse, and she she was right about that. Let me just turn off my son's phone that's charging behind me. Sure, second. sure. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, thank you. Um, so, as I suspect most members of the audience know, um, that the president of the United States, uh, shortly after the uh, events in uh, Charlottesville in the summer of 17, said that there were, quote, a lot of good people involved on both sides. I'm confident that's a position that you don't share. But I just want to turn for the remaining moments that we have a bit, because I'd be remiss if I think if I didn't do this, is that you are currently uh, involved in litigation involving the President of the United States, um, in at least one case, maybe two, but I'd like you to- Three. Three, pardon me, three. So um, if you could uh, just um, pick one of those cases that you think might be the most accessible to describe in the remaining moments we have, and to, just to talk about the case, um, one of those cases, and just tell us a little bit about the case and, and what it's like to be involved in litigation involving the President of the United States. Yeah, so the case that ironically, I think has had the biggest impact and may well continue to have the biggest impact um, is a case that we brought on behalf of the columnist, people probably know who she is, E. Jean Carroll, um, who was an advice columnist uh, for Elle magazine for many, many, many years. Incredibly witty, funny uh, woman who's an incredibly talented writer, as you can imagine. Um, and in the mid 90s, um, I'll just tell the story so people know what happened. Is in the mid 90s, she was leaving the department store Bergdorf Goodman uh, in New York, and as, as it's revolving glass doors, and as she was coming out, Donald Trump probably it was the North Door, so he's probably coming from the Plaza Hotel, which is right across the street, was coming in, and he said to her something like, "Hey, you're that advice lady," and she said something like, "Hey, you're that real estate mogul." Um, and they knew each other. They saw each other in social circles. She had a TV show on the air at the time. And he said to her, hey, can you help me buy a dress for a lady or a woman friend or something like that? And she said she kind of thought it would be a funny story to tell people, so she agreed to do it. To make a very long story short, uh, when they got to the lingerie department, he kind of pushed her into a dressing room and sexually assaulted her. Uh, fortunately, she managed to push him off. Um, and run out onto the street. And then in the next couple of days, she told two friends about it, both of whom, well, one of whom told her she should go to the police. And the other of whom said to her, don't you dare go to the police. He will destroy you if you try. Um, she waited many, many, many years to tell that story. Uh, but she wrote it in her book a couple of years ago. Um, she said that one of the reasons why she waited so long, two reasons, really. One is she couldn't stand the hypocrisy anymore. Like she would get women writing to her, asking for her advice. And she would always tell them to stand up to whatever husband or what other other man they were complaining about. And she thought it was incredibly hypocritical of her not to tell her own truth, number one. Number two, um, her mother was a staunch Republican, a very active Republican in Indiana. And she couldn't bear to break her mom's heart. Her mom had just passed away just before she started writing the book. So she wrote that book. Um, as you can imagine, the president was asked about it almost immediately after it was published. And he went on what I would call a three-day defamation tear, <laughs> where he uh, really horribly defamed her over and over again in, in the course of three days, uh, saying things like, as you can imagine, I never did it, to saying things that she's just making it up for the money, to saying that she's in a conspiracy with the Democratic Party to lie about me. Uh, to my own personal favorite, which is, I didn't do it because she's not my type. Um, so after that happened, she, as you can imagine, it did have a big impact on her. Her contract at Elle magazine was not renewed. Um, and she can talk about like hate mail and threats. What I get in Charlottesville is nothing compared to EG. Um, so she brought a defamation case in New York State Courts. Um, the case, uh, he, he, Trump did everything he could to delay the case. First, he wouldn't accept service, um, and we had to get alternative service order. Um, then he uh, took the position that as president, uh, he was immune, absolutely immune as president. We litigated that issue for many months. Ultimately, when the Supreme Court decided the Trump v. Vance case, 
the trial judge in our case said, well, that's right, this, I'm not staying the case anymore. And then after that, as people have probably read, he got the Department of Justice to intervene and say that when he, to say that when he was defaming Eugene Carroll, he was acting within the scope of his employment as president of the United States. So um, we just litigated that motion. We just got a decision a couple of weeks ago. We got a really great draw. It got assigned to Judge Kaplan in the Southern District, no relation. Um, but he concluded uh, that the Federal Tort Claims Act does not apply because defaming someone is not, or in those circumstances, is not within the duties of the president. Um, I think the election is likely to have a big impact because I think the DOJ under the Biden administration is not is likely to agree with us that the statements that Trump made were not within his presidential duties. Um, and so I guess Trump can he'll be able to appeal that issue, but not with the Department of Justice as his lawyers. He's going to have to go back to Kasowitz's firm as his lawyers. And we are very eager uh, to move forward in discovery. We've been waiting a long time to get discovery in this case. I don't think it'll be extensive. I doubt there are very many documents. Um, there should be no more than four or five depositions. And we've asked for his DNA test uh, because, believe it or not, Eugene kept the dress uh, that she was wearing that day, not for any kind of Monica Lewinsky reasons, but just because it was a very expensive dress that her editor had given her, and she couldn't stand to throw it away. <laughs> she also couldn't stand to wear it. So it was hanging in the back of her closet, and we have had a DNA expert look at it and determine that there is what's called unidentified male DNA on both the shoulder and the arm of the dress. And what is the timeline um, on what are your, you thinking about how that case is going to proceed? So we just got a literally, it's perfect time to ask the question, we just got an order this morning from Judge Kaplan uh, uh, ordering there to be a pretrial conference or an initial pretrial conference on December 11th, uh, assuming the car parties can't agree on a schedule. I think it's safe to assume that the parties will not agree on a schedule. Uh, so we will be back in front of Judge Kaplan on December 11th. Right. Well, um, I have one... Uh... I have one uh, question that's come in from the audience, and then I think we'll have, and this comes from another member of the faculty. It says, what advice would you give to an accused person who wants to publicly deny an accusation so that they avoid being charged with defamation? Um, it's very hard. The, the short answer is it's very hard. We get this question all the time. I mean, the only way to fully protect yourself, and look, the problem is that people couldn't bring defamation cases like ours for Eugene Carroll that is fully justified, uh, and I think will be proven correct. And people can bring defamation cases like the case against my client Amber Heard that is completely false, um, but she still had to defend herself in that case, both in, in London, which was just decided, and a case now in Virginia. The only complete way that we tell clients when they ask this question to um, fully immunize yourself is if you have a case that's within the statute of limitations, you're better off suing because anything you say in a pleading is immunized from a defamation claim. Um, the other option is if you live in a state in where there's a slap law that provides like California and now like New York, which is Governor Cuomo just signed the law two days ago, that provides at least some protection if the case is really ridiculous. Um, but this is a very big problem. I know in connection, my, one of my hats is I'm the chair of the board of Time's Up. And one of the reasons we created the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, honestly, is to defend women who speak up and then get sued for defamation and can't afford to defend themselves. And I can tell people, even for Amber Heard, who's a famous actress and you know, going to be an Aquaman too, even for her, the financial drain I'm defending these cases now for, I guess, three years has been extraordinary. And so imagine what it's like for someone who's not a beautiful Hollywood actress. Great. Well, we, we just have one other comment that just came in from the audience was from a student who said, thank you for defending Am Amber Heard and looking out for survivors along with queer folk. I think not committing assault is the best way to avoid being accused. Thank you. I, I would agree with that. Right. Well, I just want to thank you very much um, for um, for spending some time um, for spending some time with us today, Roberta. And I know we will all be following closely the progress of uh, these cases that you're involved in, others that we did not have time to get around to. But again, thank you, uh, 
very much for your time and for all the good work that you have been doing. It's been a real pleasure having you. Thank you. It's really been fun. And I can see it's still light there. It's practically dark here on the East Coast already. Nice Thanks talking very to you much. All. Have a good day. Take, Thank stay you. Stay healthy. You too. Safe.